the Shepherd of Hermas. This interesting apocalyptic document was written in Rome in the Greek language sometime before the middle of the second century. The author is Hermas, the brother of Bishop of Rome then Pius I, who both probably were freed former slaves. The book consists of five visions given through an angel to Hermas. This is followed by twelve mandates or commandments and ten parables. The book relies on allegory and pays a special attention to the church, calling the faithful to repent of the sins that have harmed it. Hermas was on the road to Cuma. He had a vision of Rhoda, a lady that owned him when he was sold to her some years ago. She told him that she was his accuser in heaven due to his thoughts concerning her. He was to pray for forgiveness for himself and all his house. He is consoled by a vision of the church in the form of an aged woman, weak and helpless from the sins of the faithful, who tells him to do penance and to correct the sins of his children. In the second vision she gives Hermas a book, which she afterwards takes back in order to add to it. In this vision, Clement of Rome is mentioned. Later he sees her made younger through penance, yet wrinkled and with white hair. Then again as quite young but still with white hair. And lastly, she shows herself as glorious as a bride. The fifth vision introduces the angel of repentance in the guise of a shepherd from whom the whole work takes its name. He delivers to Hermas a series of precepts which form a development of early Christian ethics. They include faith, simplicity, goodness, truth, punity, patience, righteousness, hope, etc. The eleventh mandate on humility is concerning false prophets who desire to occupy the first seats, that is to say, among the presbyters. This could be a reference to Marcian, who came to Rome around the year 140 and desired to be admitted among the priests, or possibly even to become bishop of Rome. After the mandates comes ten parables, in the form of visions, which are explained by the angel. In parable 5 the author mentions the Son of God, filled with the pre-existent Holy Spirit, presented in the form of servant, who cleanses the sins of the people, giving them the way of life and the law. The longest is parable number 9, which is an elaboration of the parable of the building of a tower, which had formed the matter of the third vision. The tower is the church, and the stones of which it is built are the faithful, whereas in the third vision it looked as though only the holy are part of the church, in parable 9 it is clearly pointed out that all the baptized are included, though they may be cast out for their sins and can be readmitted only after penance. Like most early Christian works, The Shepherd of Hermas is written in a very optimistic and hopeful tone, taking the Good Shepherd as the symbol of Christ. It was widely accepted and popular in the early church and even considered canonical scripture by some of the early church fathers, such as Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Origen. The book had great authority in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. It was bound as part of the New Testament in the Codex Sinaiticus, listed between the Acts of the Apostles and the Acts of Paul. The book seems to have been written as an encouragement to believers to endure persecution but it had a controversial aspect to it, Second Repentance. We will discuss the history behind the issue of Second Repentance in a later video. But for now, we can simply acknowledge that it caused the Shepherd of Hermas to be rejected by some other early fathers and to be considered as apocryphal. Epistle of Mathetes to Diognetus the Epistle of Mathetes to Diognetus is an example of early Christian apologetics, writings 
defending Christianity from its accusers, which would make it one of the earliest examples of apologetic literature. This writing, in 12 chapters, could have been written between 130 to the late 2nd century. The Greek writer and recipient are not surely known, as Mathetes is not a name and simply means a disciple. Diognetus was the name of a tutor of the emperor Marcus Aurelius, who admired him for his sound educational advice. It is unclear, however, if this is the same Diognetus that the text has in mind. The name Jesus or Christ are not present in the text, but Christ is referred to as the Word or Logos in Greek. Here is a beautiful reading. What the soul is for the body, that are Christians in the world. The soul is dispersed through all the members of the body, and Christians are scattered through all the cities in the world. The soul dwells in the body, yet is not of the body, and Christians dwell in the world, yet are not of the world. The invisible soul is guarded by the visible body, and Christians are known indeed to be in the world, but their godliness remains invisible. The flesh hates the soul and wars against it, though itself suffering no injury, because it is prevented from enjoying pleasures. The world also hates the Christians, though in no wise injured, because they abjure pleasures. The soul loves the flesh that hates it and the members, Christians likewise love those that hate them. Quadratos of Athens Saint Quadratos of Athens is said to have been the first of the Christian apologists. Eusebius states that Quadratus was a disciple of the apostles who became bishop of Athens after the martyrdom of Publius and that through his zeal, the Athenian Christians were brought together again and their faith revived. Quadratus addressed a discourse to the Roman Emperor Hadrian, containing a defense or apology of the Christian religion, when the emperor was visiting Athens in the year 124 or 125. Quadratus and Aristides being the earliest apologists, are spoken of by Eusebius as men of understanding and of apostolic faith. Eusebius records the only surviving fragment written by Quadratus. Our Savior's works, moreover, were always present, for they were real, consisting of those who had been healed of their diseases, those who have been raised from the dead, who were not only seen whilst they were being healed or raised up, but were afterwards constantly present nor did they remain only during the sojourn of the Savior on earth, but also a considerable time after his departure. And indeed, some of them have survived even down to our own times. Third Jewish Rebellion During the reign of Hadrian in the year 132, the third and final Jewish revolt took place against the Romans in Judea province by a leader called Simon, who took the title Nasi Israel or Prince of Israel. The Sanhedrin, with Rabbi Akiva, declared Simon as the Jewish Messiah and called him Bar Kahba or Bar Kochba, which means son of the star. Simon was ruthless, punishing any Jew who refused to join his ranks and was mostly killing Jewish Christians for holding Christ as the true Messiah. This war was fought around 132 to 135. Initial rebel victories established an independent state of Israel until a Roman army made out of six full legions finally crushed it. This final defeat resulted in an extensive depopulation of the Jews and they were barred by Romans from entering Jerusalem and the city was renamed Elia Capitolina, after Hadrian. Despite easing persecution of Jews following Hadrian's death in 138, the Romans barred Jews and even Jewish Christians from Jerusalem who refused to support Bar Kochba. The war and its aftermath 
helped differentiate Christianity as a religion distinct from Judaism. In Jerusalem, the remaining Christians elected Marcus, who became the first Gentile Christian Bishop of Jerusalem since Bishop ceased to be appointed from among the Jews. The Martyrdom of Polycarp This document tells the story of Polycarp's arrest and martyrdom. Polycarp, at the age of 86, had a large reputation as the Bishop of Smyrna, something that pagans could not tolerate. In 155, the pagan mob in Smyrna demanded Polycarp's execution, and being arrested he was taken into a stadium to be executed as part of Roman brutal entertainment. The consul, Lucius Statius Quadratus, asks the 86-year-old Polycarp to swear to Caesar as a god and to curse Christ. Polycarp answers, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? Council Quadratus threatens Polycarp with wild beasts and burning him alive. Then bring on that fire, answers Polycarp which only burns for a short time and then goes out. Apparently you are ignorant of the everlasting fire of judgment and punishment which awaits the wicked. Why do you delay? I am ready to die for Jesus Christ. Polycarp prays and then they put him to the fire. When the fire fails to burn him, he is stabbed to death and was then fully burned to ashes. The book Martyrdom of Polycarp, written around 156, one year after his martyrdom, states that Polycarp was taken on the day of the Sabbath and killed on the Great Sabbath. Polycarp's life and courage in the face of death has inspired generations of believers. He is considered a saint in almost all the churches. Ironically, these persecutions used to tremendously increase the number of Christian faithful converts. The greatest enemy of the church were the cults that were deceiving the faithful away from the church, the most dangerous of which we will see next time.